Hello, everybody. Good morning. Uh, I thought in honor of the fact that we were doing the tribes thing um, and putting our little stars and circles on, I would do some self-disclosure um, so you know where I am and where I'm coming from. This is the quandary that I'm going to address today. Um, it's not an education on kink. This is actually about uh, the therapist quandary. So uh, when a client presents with both a history of traumatic abuse and a concurrent interest in BDSM, is this particular identity or sexual behavior A, healthy, harmless healing for them, or B, needing to be worked with therapeutically? Um, and the intent is in 20 minutes flat to try and give you an overview of some guidance. It's not going to be easy, so bear with me. Um, right, that's an overview of the presentation. Um, so I've, I've tried to minimize it into that 20 minutes into six sections. Um, so you can make some lists for yourself or hopefully this will be available afterwards. Um, and you can have a good stab at trying to assess that with these tools. Client appropriateness, life overview, weight, importance, purpose, consent and boundaries, specifics and mental health issues. I'm going to go into each of those sections um, hopefully in enough time and enough detail. Um, but they're the areas that we really want to be looking at when we're confronted with a client who has a concurrent interest in BDSM and a history of traumatic abuse. Client appropriateness. Now, this one's usually quite uh, politically challenging. The mental acuity, the cognition and understanding. I'm loath to use the word intelligence because I think we all measure that in different ways. But there is an element of that to be considered in this context. Um, in the same way as a child or an animal cannot consent, neither can someone who doesn't have enough mental acuity to understand what it is that they're engaging in and why. Okay, so it is valid, it is appropriate, it is important. Um, and it by no means undermines anyone who has any kind of um, disability in that department. It simply means this may not be an appropriate choice for them. Okay, self-awareness. Um, when clients present to us, we usually get a pretty good clue within a session or two of where they're at with their self-awareness. Um, you know, varying from, I hate the world, the whole life sucks, um, you know, it's all a bag of crap, to, I struggle with this, and this is why I think I struggle with this, and can you help me not struggle with this? A little bit more along the, the self-awareness bell curve, if you like. Um, so, first of all, to, an, to, to assess in the first, you know, couple of sessions, is the self-awareness um, apparent? Is it appreciable? Just how self-aware are they? Because those are the things that inform whether or not this is a healthy choice for them or not. Um, whether they can make their own decisions about such things. Being self-aware enables us to make better choices. Um, Self-care and care of others is another uh, really important department because it's important in life. We all know self-care is sexy far more attracted to people who are actually taking care of themselves. Oh, I need to uh, reference that. Lee Harrington first said that self-care is sexy and I've adopted it because I think it's an ace. Is it demonstrable? Are they, are they turning up as a client in a state of disarray, unclean, um, untidy? What is their self-care like? Um, I don't actually care what they wear, but is it clean? You know, um, have a look because self-care will be indicated by those things and in the way that they address life. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll move on to that in a bit, but um, those are the three things that I think are my first critical judgments on whether a, a client is actually in a position to choose healthily. I mean, this is what I've said. Are, are there issues to consider around the client's ability to both consent and choose appropriately? So that's my first consideration. Um, obviously, I can only speak from, peri uh, from the point of view of my own experience, you know, take it with a pinch of salt and, and pick and choose what, what works for you. But this is how I have dealt with clients presenting with issues in the past. So life overview, what does the rest of the client's <laughs> life look like? Um, that really is important to me. As much as self-awareness and self-care, for me, what does the rest of their life look like? Am I saying that if someone cannot work, if they're not having sex, they can't do it? No, of course not. What I'm saying is, what are their attitudes, what are their behaviours, what are their beliefs around these things? Work, relationships, family. Yes, some people have a complete disconnect with their biological family. They may have a perfectly functioning chosen family. It's not a case of tick them out, rule them out of it. It's a case of what are their healthy behaviours and attitudes around those things. Okay, so the life overview really is about getting a, a, a feel for the whole person. Is this simply the way they have sex? Is it actually a relevant issue at all? 
Um, or is it? Is it part? Is it part and deeper? Okay. Um, presenting issues, of course. What is it that they came to you for? If it's absolutely nothing to do with the BDSM, you know, perhaps they came to you for bereavement. They just happen to have a BDSM issue or a BDSM choice, chosen lifestyle. Okay. So, is it relevant? Um, so, what is the context in consideration of BDSM as a relevant issue, issue or not? Okay. Now this one's quite important, everybody recognises it. I'm waiting for the groan. <laughs> <laughs> Maslow's hierarchy of need. Every, it, it's really, I was looking for something incredibly simplistic to demonstrate what it is that I need to talk about. Um, where does it sit in that hierarchy for them? Is it, this is who I am and this is the entirety of me? Could be some problems, could be some issues. Is it simply how they have sex? Great. Is it something deeper than that? Is it just their behaviour? Or is it a source of their identity? Does it being a part of their identity mean that's a bad thing? I think I can safely say it's part of my identity. It's not the whole of my identity, and I think that's the issue. Um, choice, uh, function. What is its function for them? Is it just to have great sex? Or is it around these, these are the, the real key issues that I want you to go home and think about. If you take nothing else from this presentation, healthy or unhealthy, First of all, are they utilising it for catharsis? We'll talk more about that when we get into specifics. Are they using it for healing? Is it life enhancing for them? Or is it abuse pattern? These are the things that we obviously think of as therapists. Is it pattern repeating or, or perpetuating? Are they simply repeating cycles of abuse? Are they essentially sitting with the comfort blanket they're aware of and they know even if it's actually not a very comfortable comfort blanket? Is that unhealthy? The question of paraphilia and fetishism, you know, is it harmless or addiction? I'm sure we're going to have some conversation around that today in other, people's in other people's talks. But bottom line is, if you have a real fetish for shoes, is that an issue? Is that a problem? Or is it just another form of sexuality? If you can't actually have sex without those shoes, perhaps it's something to look at a little deeper. Yeah? Okay. Um, so that's where, that's where I looked at it. I'm sure everybody can sort of see that, and if not, you all know it, I'm absolutely sure. Um, where does it sit for the client in that? How important is it? What is the weight that they put on it? Okay. Consent and boundaries, as Meg's already spoken about. Um, this is in examining this crucial part of the equation. Along with self-awareness, they must have an awareness of their own consent and boundaries, their understanding of that, of that as a function. So great clues, if a client's always late, always pays late, they're not terribly great at boundaries, yeah? It's very simplistic to say that, but these are just literally nitpicking clues. Appropriateness within the therapeutic relationship, is their, is their love of BDSM such that they can't resist being flirtatious or sexual? Is it, is it ingrained enough that actually it becomes a difficulty within the um, therapeutic relationship is there, for example, their need for uh, the comfort blanket of submission, i.e. complete relinqu relinquishing of responsibility, such <coughs> that they're looking to you for a DS form of therapy. I've had several conversations over the years where I've had to actually clarify that boundary for people and say, this is not a DS relationship, this is a therapeutic relationship because sometimes it can slip in. So appropriateness within the therapeutic relationship, talking, listening, are they talking over you? Are they listening to you? Are they <sighs> railroading you through a session and you don't actually get a word in edgeways? Um, those are all ways of examining their ideas around boundaries and consent. Within the kink BDSM world, uh, world there's an awful lot that we could talk about. Um, we don't have time to talk about, but great key um, things are safe words. Oh, I never work without safe words. He can do whatever he likes to me because I trust him completely. Not necessarily the best boundaries to come from when you have. It may be somebody's choice who doesn't have a history of traumatic abuse. It may be somebody's choice who has processed through their history of traumatic abuse. But not using safe words <coughs> when you haven't processed or you have had that um, is probably an indication of not great boundaries, not great consent and safe, oh yeah. Behaviour around safe practice, safe practice for sex, you know, how, how is that for them? How is the, um, the idea of safe sex for them or are they blithely ignoring it because actually their self-care is not where it should be, yeah? 
um, and life in general with regard to self and others, behaviour and attitudes. And uh, it's another good place to look. Um, you know, uh, is everybody, including the neighbour and the neighbours, uh, neighbours, uncles, dog, sort of, you know, against them and anti and horrible and, and dreadful, or? Um, are they actually quite open to other people's differences as well, other people's ways of being? Mm? So they're just sort of quick tip where to look for how they feel around consent and boundaries, what their understanding, what their awareness is around consent and boundaries. Because um, <coughs> I don't believe you can engage in BDSM relationships, healthy or otherwise, unless you have a clue about consent and boundaries. So great place to start. Specifics, this is where it gets really tricky and into the nitty gritty of things. Uh, if we have a client that presents who is supposedly healthily engaging in age play but they've had a history of sexual child abuse, um, how do we work out whether that's healthy or not? We've got to come back to the same questions about self-awareness. How are they with their processing? How are they with their boundaries? What is it for? What's its purpose for them? Um, an awful lot of people do use, as I mentioned earlier, uh, that kind of thing for healing and catharsis. So in other words, too often, for example, in the case of rape play, it may be actually that what they want to do is be able to say no, where previously they couldn't. It may be they want to go through the process and allow themselves to enjoy it so that they don't carry it with them. Age play is the same with childhood sexual abuse. Often it's non-sexual, often it's about being nurtured and feeling safe where previously they weren't. In some cases it is sexual because the guilt and the shame is what needs to be processed and worked through so actually they want to be allowed to enjoy it as an adult in that child's mind, in their own mind. Okay, um, So it's worth looking at all these things, dominance and submission, same abuse of power if they've been raised in a family or a situation where there was an abuse of power, is DS simply a way of replicating that for them? Or is it a way of processing it? Is it the therapeutic work that you can do with them to help them to understand their own power, their own personal power, and then to play with the exchange of it consensually? Um, Self-harm, self-harm by proxy. I've had this uh, uh, come up a few times where people who have been self-harmers have discovered the BDSM world and found a way that they can do it healthily. Healthily being the operative term. I've learned how to cut myself safely. How much of that is BDSM and how much of that is actually just self-harm self uh, reframed? Um, I'm certainly not decrying uh, people who enjoy things like scarification or decorative cutting and all that sort of body modification stuff. That's a whole world of, you know, interest of its own, which I'm not berating what I am suggesting that is if there's a history of self-harm really that needs looking at uh, absolutely to make sure that in the same mm. as all the other cases this is something that either you are working through with them before they engage with um, perhaps it may be for example with um, the age play that actually they found it but they're not really wa sure why they're doing it they haven't processed it so perhaps there needs to be a period of time where they cease the behavior whilst they work through it and then they can choose the behaviour from a safe, you know, a consensual place, from a, a place of self-awareness and self-understanding. Okay, so the key question is, is it pattern repeating, abuse replicating, or is it catharsis, healing, self-actualisation? Is this a life-enhancing experience which is helping them work through their history of abuse in order to be life-enhancing to get them to a place of self-awareness and self-understanding and satisfaction? <coughs> yeah. Or again, is it simply healthy fun that's nothing to do with the issue that they come to you for? Okay. Um, mental health issues is another biggie. Um, this is far too big for a 20 minute conversation. Um, however, depression, stress, anxiety, in the same way that a child or an animal can't actually consent um, with full adult awareness and consideration, neither can somebody on drugs or alcohol, um, and somebody who has serious mental health issues um, may struggle to make the same safe choices for themselves. Do I, do I mean to say if you have borderline personality disorder you can't possibly have a BDSM sex life? No, of course not. But again, it's about that process. How is the self-care? How is the self-awareness? How is the understanding in the client 
how big is your task to help them reach that place so that it becomes a healthy choice for them. Um, considerations, I mean, just one out of thin air, I mentioned borderline personality disorder. Um, what are the key symptoms of that? So absolutely, top of the tree is they feel things deeper. They feel things for longer. They can't let them go. They struggle to let things go. They're terrified of rejection and criticism. Those are the key things. Put that into a BDSM context and you, you literally made your cauldron really bubbling. You know, it's really full of stuff to work with. Um, so does it mean that a person with borderline personality disorder can't have a BDSM healthy, cathartic healing process? No, it means that they absolute, the self-awareness is crucial. The understanding of their condition is crucial. The understanding of how that's going to affect them in terms of aftercare, in terms of all those things that we consider when we're just engaging in BDSM without the history. Yeah. Okay, so as I say, mental health issues, it doesn't mean that you can't. It does mean that there's a heck of a lot more safety, um, a heck of a lot more um, issues to consider before you say, oh, yeah, no problem, this is healthy, a healthy choice for you. Okay, make sure the client, it's not just about you understanding it, it's about the client understanding how it's going to affect and impact on them. And therefore, they can make a choice from a better educated position from about themselves and more self-aware. So do mental health issues rule out kink positive choices? Healthy and unhealthy? No, I don't believe it does. Um, it is about that awareness, the awareness of additional risks. Um, I would suggest depression, stress and anxiety, although perhaps less of an issue than a specific diagnosis, um, is still an issue because <coughs> the repercussions of BDSM in a play relationship um, are pretty pretty big for all of us. Um, for somebody who is suffering additional stress, additional anxiety or depression, those after effects are going to be more, bigger, greater. Okay, So it is worth consideration. Doesn't mean that they can't, it just means they need a full awareness and understanding of where they are. Um, conclusions, <laughs> to round it up. Um, when a client presents with a history of traumatic abuse and a concurrent interest in BDSM, consider the following. Client appropriateness. How appropriate is, them, is it for them for a human being? What is their mental acuity? Um, wider life overview. What does the rest of their life look like? How functional are they? How high functioning are they in other ways, in other manners of their life? What is their self-care? What do they look like? Are they clean? And I'm not, I seem to be fetishizing being clean, but actually I just mean self-care. Are they looking after themselves in other ways? Um, the weight and importance and purpose, where is it for them on you know, the hierarchy of needs? Where does it sit? What purpose does it serve for them? Is it right down there, happy, just about sex? Or is it deeper than that? And is that the work that you need to do with them to bring their awareness to it, not to change their choices, but to help them make the choices better for themselves. Um, consent and boundaries, understanding and practice, huge. Can't underestimate that. Um, the importance of an understanding of, of consent and boundaries within the BDSM context is greater than most. Um, right up there with self-care and self-awareness. Specifics and relevance for the client and case. So if you're talking about somebody who is into age play, for example, or who is into violence, for example, when they've come from a violent, abusive background, it's about honing that down, finding out what it is that they're getting from this and why. Why are they doing that? Do they need some therapeutic work to better understand their own processes as to why and how it's best going to serve them? Um, mental health issues, absolutely worth um, assessing because of the impact upon them is going to be greater than your average Joe blogs. Um, then assess, is a BDSM interest, identity appropriate, healthy or unhealthy for this client? <laughs> Final note, the answer may of course change for them. I went back two days later and added that in because I suddenly thought, oh, you may come to the conclusion that at this point in time, th that particular practice is not appropriate for that client but through therapeutic work, they may be able to make the choice later to enjoy that safely. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Happy to take questions. Can I just make a comment and say thank you for raising two issues that I don't hear raised very often? Certainly. One is um, actually looking at what it takes to be able to give consent and highlighting how important that is mm -hmm. when you're doing therapeutic work around this area 
and when a client presents with these issues as to making sure whether this is actually an issue or not and making yeah. a distinction. Thank you. And yeah. the second is raising the issues of other of mental health in, in that very big way. It's a huge issue, unfortunately. I had a very small amount of time, but I think uh, it, it was enough information to help people to look further into it, and hopefully that was enough. Yeah, no, my experience as a person who identifies in this way, as both a client and a therapist, is, mm -hmm. is that mental health seems to be a tick box, rather than actually exploring the choice and appropriateness and looking at what therapy can do to change and facilitate change. Absolutely agree. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so for your comment. I was just thinking how you saw RAC with the therapy Yes, RAC, risk aware consensual kink. Absolutely. Does your client, and then in terms of how I deal with the guest, risk aware consent, or if they have mental health issues, are they aware of the risks this might have to their left? So it's all giving back to them the power. If they're able to work for the RAC framework, Absolutely. So your question is, how useful is the terminology of RAC? It was more of a mm. comment. An observation. All the way through. But the other thing was, you mentioned active care, and I, for my mind, an awful lot of that awareness of the risk and awareness of the implications. Right, that, yeah. Again, that's such a huge implication. It is, but I think in 20 minutes I was, I was focusing on the pre um, therapy, the assessment of, of whether or not this is uh, healthy or unhealthy from the outset rather than the aftercare which comes a little bit later. Once your client is, is absolutely self aware and self understanding and in a better position to make those choices, if they're fully understanding of boundaries and consent, then discussions around aftercare, in particular where mental health is involved, um, is absolutely vital. You're quite right. Thank you for pointing that out. Thank you. Um, just to go back to mental acuity, um, I can't help but think about the Mental Capacity Act and help helping people make informed decisions through decisional balance, for example. Along with this, I think, you know, in terms of the cycle of change, people learn from their mistakes, people learn from their risk taking, and really helping people become aware of that is something, you know, kind of saying, okay, this happened, I had an outcome you weren't happy with. What can we do so we change the behaviour very gently and slightly so it becomes more and more maybe, I don't know, something that people would that they choose they want to do or don't want to do? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I agree. I, I believe that was a comment rather than a question, but thank yeah, you very yeah. much for your comment. Much appreciated. Okay, just a quick one. Um, I was really struck when I saw the film of the Fifty Shades of Grey um, how a lot of the writing about it was all about kind of this is a woman and a man and a man dominant and a woman submissive and very little about the fact that Christian Grey had experienced violent abuse as a child and then sexual abuse as an adolescent and I wondered if you could speak to you know are people who are in the submissive or bottom position maybe a bit more aware of those possible links than people who are top or dominant? Or, you know, it's a very interesting question. Don't get me started talking about Fifty Shades. I've enjoyed. <laughs> actually, actually, my greatest beef with the book, with um, Fifty Shades of Grey, my greatest beef wasn't the crap writing. It wasn't <laughs> even the non-consent. My greatest beef was the fact that in order to be into kink, he had to have been abused. Yeah. 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 Mm. Sorry. So to answer your question, do I think, can you summarise that for me? We've got this idea in society, problematically, that you know people who are abused may well become into kink, but often mm -hmm. as the submissive or, or bottom. I wondered if it was a, you know, it just felt like it was a, all that was a bit eclipsed in uh, thinking about the film, and I wondered if they, maybe people who are in the dominant or top position are maybe a bit less likely to think about the impact of those things in their past, or, or you know, or do they think? I think it's equally relevant. I think it's absolutely equally relevant. Some people will choose to fall into the submissive role, for example, because they have been on the receiving end of abuse and therefore that's, it's the role that they uh, identify with. Um, on the other hand, in the same way as child abuse, abuse is either often either replicated through the, through the generations or fought against and adamantly not replicated. I think it's a very similar thing and there is a, a potential danger for some of abuse victims to become dominants in order to become perpetrators rather than victims. So yes, it is relevant on every level. Thank you. Just to clarify, I'm noticing very aware I work with a lot of teenagers and young people and they're becoming a lot more interested in the sort of BDSM world. How you know, what kind of advice and guidance would this really apply to teenagers as well? Or do you think this is slightly different? 
Right, so how appropriate is this for educating teenagers? Uh, my teenagers are all very educated. Um, they know about safe calls and safe words. Um, uh, do I think it's appropriate? I can sort of answer, and, and in reference to your comment earlier, uh, somebody asked you to crystal gaze, crystal ball gaze. Um, I'm already teaching this stuff in college. Hasn't got to primary yet or secondary yet, but it's already in college. So yeah, I, I absolutely think it's completely appropriate to educate teenagers, certainly. Thank you. How do you avoid a situation of becoming a police therapist or a, the paternalistic model? Like, say you go through this process with somebody and you have severe concerns, and they go through the process with you and they don't. What, what do you do with that situation? I think that's probably, that's a very good question, by the way. Thank you. Extremely good question, because I'm busy going, what? Um, right, I genuinely believe that is the case in most therapy. I don't think that's BDSM specific. I think that's um, something that you're going to come across with your client work is literally um, you will come to a different conclusion to your client. That happens in all walks of, of their understanding and their life. Um, where this is concerned, uh, I think I would be inclined to fall down on the same baseline confidentiality rules. If I think they're actually in danger of harming themselves or somebody else, then I'm still ethically obliged to do something about it. If I think not, then um, I would continue to work with them. Simple. Uh, I hope that un uh, answers your question. It's quite a difficult question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.